Okay, good evening everybody, it's Monday night, so it's another Chumash class, Parsha. Uh, when Parsha is Vayetze, which is a remarkable Parsha, there's a lot going on. It's basically the birth of the Jewish nation, so to speak, as far as the birth of the Shvatim. But let's discuss a little bit various different aspects of the Parsha. Okay, the Parsha opens up with Vayetze Yaakov Mereshava Vayelacharana. Yaakov went bear Shavu. What happened was Esav wanted to kill Yaakov because he took away the brachas. Rivka was told with her divine providence of prophecy that uh, Esav wants to kill Yaakov. She came to Yitzchak and said, I don't want my son Yaakov to marry these Kanani girls. I want him to go to love himself. So Yitzchak says, you're right. He calls in Yaakov. He says, okay, go. So the Pasuk said, Yaakov went from Be'er Shava to, to go into Choron. He met, he bumped into the places that, as the Medrash says, Hashem made the sun set early. He wanted him to sleep there. It was the place of the base of Migdash and all the various things. And as our sages say, Yaakov instituted the prayer of Maerit. Avram Avinu instituted Shachris the morning. Yitzchak instituted Mincha. The afternoon and Yaakov instituted Maidus. But every, as we learned many, many times, that every aspect in Torah is a lesson. It's not some a story that took place. So the Yetzi Yaakov in Be'er Shava represents Yaakov going out from a place of Kedusha to Choron, which was the city where Lavan lived. But Choron, the Gemara Medri says, Choron Av Shomakim is a place that Hashem gets angry, meaning it's full of evil. It's a terrible place, corruption, evil. And this Pasuk actually represents, as Chassidus explains, the neshama coming into the body. It represents the neshama coming into the body. It represents, as in Yaakov's case, somebody going out to get married. And it's represented every day of a person's life. Now, what does this mean in a deeper sense? Yaakov represents the Jew, okay, the holiness of Kedusha. This Yaakov represents the Neshama, goes out from Be'er Sheva. What is Be'er Sheva? It's a city in Israel. But we know that Tanya begins with the Gemara that says that before Neshama is born, Mashbi and Isai, simply it means the, the Neshama, the soul, is administered in oath. The heat sadik ba'alti Russia. You should be a sadik, and you should not be a Russia. So Chassidus asks the question: The neshama itself, if she wants to be a sadik, why? What's the purpose of administering an oath to the neshama that it should be a sadik? It's the body that sins, not the neshama. The neshama is a part of Hashem. So Chassidus explains that mashbian does not only mean giving an oath, a vow. It also comes in the word, as we say in benching, the achalta is savata. Savata means full. Sevia means you're satisfied, you're full. Now, the Rebbe explains in Tanya that this Gemara, Majbi and Eisei, that we administer an oath to the Neshama, to the Tzadik, that it could, not that it should be, that it could be a Tzadik, not a Russia. That means before Neshama comes into the world, the neshama is given additional power upstairs from Hashem that he could be a tzaddik. And not, that means he can overcome the difficulties of life. But yet Yaakov Meber Shava represents the neshama coming down into the world. The neshama coming down into the body, the animal soul, the yetzahara, and so on. Where does our neshama come from? From this place of Be'er Sheva. Not only is it ultimate Kedusha Ra'at Yisrael, but it also is the concept of where the neshama is administered the oath, the, the power that it could be a tzaddik. From a lofty place of Kedusha. Where does the neshama come into? It goes into Charein Avshalmok, meaning the neshama comes into a body, into a corrupt world, a body that wants to sin, animal soul that wants to sin. All these things, that's where the neshama comes from the lofty place 
into the other place. What is the purpose of this neshama coming into the world? What is the purpose of Ayeti Yaakov Meber Shava? That the neshama goes out from this lofty heavenly place where they're given the powers to Choran. So the Pasik continues. He took from the stones of the place and he put it around his head. <clears throat> he went to sleep. He fell asleep. Hashem made him fall asleep. At the end of the story, after he wakes up from his dream and he realizes it's a holy place, so it says, <laughs> The Pasik says like this. Yaakov Avinu took the single stone. At the beginning, the Pasik says he took Avne Hamokin, stones plural. And then at the end, the Pasik says at the end of the story, it says he took from the stone of the place. So Rashi comments, interestingly, beginning it says stones and now it says stone. The Rashi says when Yaakov put it around his head, so to speak, to put his head on, let, let rest his head. So all the stones started fighting. They wanted Yaakov Avinu's head to be on them. So what did Hashem do? Hashem made a miracle. He made all the stones into one. So now when Yaakov Avinu put his head on any part of the stone, he put his head on all the stones. That's the simple meaning of the puzzle. Well, let's take it much, much deeper and how this applies not only to Yaakov Avinu then, but to each one of us now. The purpose why Hashem created the world we learned in Tanya, we learned in classes all over the place. Hashem wanted a dira v'tachtainim. Hashem wanted a dwelling place in a low physical world. What does that mean in simple practical English? Hashem created a very low world. Tachten, low that there's nothing spiritually lower than that. A world that's empty from godliness, a world that's only pluralism, a world that's only diversity, a world that's not interested in anything holy. All it wants is me, 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 me. Idols, 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 idol worshiping. Whatever the idol worshiping, it could be money, it could be food, it could be clothing, it could be whatever. What is the role of the Jew? The role of the Jew is to take pluralism and make it into one, make it godly, to show that the whole world, with all its diversity, with all of what seems to be tachtainim, the lowest of low that seems to be void from godliness, our role and mission in the world is to show that this world is really godly. What's the void of the Jew? The Nisham is coming into the body. Yaakov's coming from Be'er Shavi into Choron, like we said before. So what's the void? The Pasuk says, take stones, pluralism, and make it into one stone. Make it into godliness. And I, sages tell us that stones are similar to letters, you know, uh, you build a house through many stones and many houses make a block and many blocks make a name. The same thing with words. Letters make a word, words make a sentence, sentence makes a paragraph, paragraph makes chapters, and so on. So in Sefer Yitzira, he likens <clears throat> stones with letters. What is the role of a Jew to take pluralism and make it one stone? Now, how is that done? Yaakov Avinu took stones and put it around his head. And Rashi comments, why did he put it around his head? Well, he was in a, in a desert. I don't know where he was. <clears throat> he needed to be protected from the wild animals. That's what Rashi says. But Yosem and Asheisav, he put it around his head. Why did he put it around his head? So he was afraid of the wild beasts. Okay? And therefore he put protection around his head. So the Rebbe asks in a famous sicha, every person knows if there's wild beasts, putting it around your head is not going to save you. They can attack your heart. They can attack different parts of the body. 
Why do you want to put it around your head? <clears throat> Why is the Torah teaching us that he put it around his head? He took stones to protect himself. The Torah says, no, he put it around his head to protect his head. If he wants to be protected from the animals of the world, it's not enough putting stones around your head. And the Rebbe explains this is part of the mission of the Jew. The Mishnah Pirkei of his quotes a Pasuk that says it's in Tilim. Yegia kapecho kisecho. If you work, you give the effort of your hands, the palm of your hands, if that's how you're going to make a living, asherecho <clears> v'teilo. <throat> Fortunate and it's very good for you. What should a person do? The Pasuk says you should work, make a living with your hands. So the Rebbe explains the Pasuk says the work of your hands. Where should your head be, though? Your head should be in Torah mitzvahs. Your head should be <clears throat> in the business. <clears throat> now, obviously, if you want to make a living, you got to use your head out to make a living. What the Rebbe is explaining is what is the purpose of the business? The purpose of the business is that the head should be able to vote time to learn and to daven and to do mitzvahs and do everything it does. So the Rebbe explains what happened over here. Yaakov Avinu is coming down, the Nisham is coming down. And he has to take pluralism, a world of corruption and everything, and he has to make it godly. What is it you need to protect? their head, their vision. What do I want from life? Do I want to live a, live, a, live a life like a religious Jew with making a living to be able to raise children and a family and, and, and get pay tuition? Or is it just to have a good time? So the Pasuk is teaching us in this whole portion, there's tons and tons of lessons that we can learn in a daily way of a Jew's neshama coming into the world, the role of the Jew is to make from pluralism many stones into one stone and in a way that he protects his head. Now that applies, like we said, when the neshama comes into the body. This also applies when somebody is looking for a shidduch. What did Yaakov go out for? Yaakov is going out for a shidduch. What does this mean? Let's take a typical yeshiva boy. The yeshiva boy is in the four walls of the yeshiva. He's learning. He's davening. He has no responsibilities, no financial responsibilities. Now he has to go in. He has to leave the yeshiva. He has to go into Choram. He has to go into a world that's mean. And he has to make a living and still be able to be a religious Jew. The way Hashem wants him to be. So again, the same thing applies. And now that it applies in a daily way. You get up in the morning, you have to take on the day, like the expression is. As we all know, if you're in the business world, like some of you were just saying, right? Mr. Gold was saying that they're blocked in by anti-Jewish protesters in this business. Okay, they were there for six hours and then they had that they were graffiti and terrible things. This is the world we're facing today. A Jew needs to know what is your role on a daily basis? You get up in the morning, you need to protect your head. The first thing. What does that mean? The Jew protects his head. They have to protect the Yiddishkeit. What do they need to do? The first thing, you daven. And then you go learn. Then you're protecting your head. <clears throat> then Yaakov feels protected enough that he can get up and go to Lovin's house, get married, take on the world, and not become affected by it. So this lesson of Yaakov is not only the story that took place. This represents the neshamas coming into the body on a regular basis and a day when a person is born. It represents the day-to-day -day living. It represents when a person is making a shidduch. They need to know we have to protect the head. And the job is to make pluralism into one. And by the way, where did Yaakov build the Jewish nation? Out of the 12 Shvatim, 11 
were born in Lavan's house. Only Binyamin was born on the way back. 11 out of 12 Shvatim were born in Lavan's house. And we'll get to that later. The only way a Jew can accomplish, the only reason why the Neshama comes into the world, why doesn't the Neshama just stay upstairs in Ganeid and basking in godliness? Why does the Neshama have to go into Choron? Why was Yaakov Avinu told to go into Choron? Because a Jew can only accomplish great things when they go into Choron, when they go into a love and house, a world of deceit, as the Hefseid is called, Alma de Shikra. It's a world of falseness. Only there, Tachtainim in the lowest level, when a Jew behaves like a Yaakov Avinu in the home of Lavan, that's where you could build Judaism. That's where you accomplish what Hashem wants us to do. That's the concept of Dira Tachtainim. Okay, now there's another interesting thing over here. Yaakov Avinu dreamt. What was the dream? A ladder. He saw a ladder standing on the earth all the way up to the heaven. And he saw Malachi Elokim, the angels of God, Olim Vyordim, were going up the ladder, down the ladder. The Rashi asks a question. First, angels are in heaven. So angels should first be coming down and then going up. In the ladder, in the dream of the ladder, it says they were going up and down. So Rashi asks the question. And Rashi answers, Yaakov, when he left Israel, was accompanied by the Israeli angels, the holy Eretz Yisrael angels. He came to the border of, of Eretz Yisrael when Eretz Yisrael was finished. So the Israeli angels left and the, the diaspora angels came down. That's what Rashi says. The simple meaning. There's a very interesting story. The Heilige Ruzhener, who was known as Rabbi Sol Ruzhener, we did, the Rabbim called him the Heilige Ruzhener. He was very close with the Tzamech Sedek, in the Tzamech Sedek's time. When he was a kid, four years old, five years old, whatever, learning Chumash with, Rash, with his teacher, every Pasuk that he learned, he asked already Rashi's questions before he learned the Rashi. He learned the Pasuk, he already was a brilliant kid. He asked his teacher, his Rebbe, Rashi's questions. It came to this Pasuk, he didn't ask his Rebbe anything. No question. So his Rebbe said to him, Yisraelik, come on, come on, how come you're not asking me the question, why are the angels going up and down? It's the wrong order. So the Rujana, this little kid said to him, Rebbe, it was a dream. On a dream, you don't ask questions. People always dream crazy things, so to speak. It was a dream. I can't ask a question. Why? And it's a, that's what the dream was. So you can't ask a question. The dream. There's another interesting story. Rashi says that when Yaakov Avinu dreamt, the whole Eretz Yisrael was put under Yaakov Avinu. Hashem put the whole and Rashi says. Uh, he took yeah. In the dream, Hashem took the whole Eretz Yisrael and put it under Yaakov Avinu. That's what he says. This land that you're resting on refers to Eretz Yisrael. So a little girl is printed. A little girl asked the Rebbe a question. In the Kutus Sichus it's printed, interestingly. little girl asked the Rebbe if the whole Eretz Yisrael was put under Yaakov Avinu, where was Yitzchak? If the whole Israel was put under Yaakov Avinu's Head, so what happened to Yitzhak? <laughs> so the Rebbe answered, you know, what are you asking me a question? It was a dream. He dreamt that Hashem put the whole to Yitzhak on this. Okay? So that's the story in the simple meaning of the Pasuk. Let's take it a little bit deeper. We said before, Chassidus explains that this ladder, Yaakov Vina instituted Maidu, Davini. Avram made Shachat, who said, Yitzchak made Mincha, Yaakov made Maidah. What is the concept of a ladder? The Pasuk says, there was a Sula Mutz of Artsa resting on the ground, and the previous Rebbe says, it doesn't say Eretz. Artsa means even lower than, than the earth. 
Bereshemagi Hashemaimah, and the top of it was in Hashemaimah, means even higher than that. What is, let's take this spiritually, what is the concept of a ladder? The purpose of a ladder is to connect the floor with the roof, the floor with the ceiling. A ladder connects up and down, higher and lower. That's the purpose of a ladder. Yaakov Avinu's dream, which was the institution of the Tefillah of Maidav at night, his dream was the concept of davening. What is davening? Davening is like uh, instead of the sacrifices today, we don't have the base of so we now we daven. What is the sacrifice? You take a physical animal and you bring it on the, on the Mizbeach. Okay? Put it on the Mizbeach and you sacrifice it. You bring it up to God. Right? It goes up. Torah learning, even though some of us should say Sulam is the numerical value of Sinai, which represents Mat and Torah. But generally speaking, this Yaakov Avino Sulam represents the level of Tefillah. What does Tefillah mean? Tefillah, the word Tefillah does not mean prayer. Rebbe says the Hebrew word for prayer is Bakosha. In Hebrew, the word for Tefillah, is, a prayer is a Bakosha, a request. Tefillah comes from the word, many words, it means to judge, lefalel, means to judge. But also, Chassidus explains, the word tefillah means binding and connection. Naftule elokim niftalti, naftali, was called naftali, Rachi said, because my husband became connected to me. There's a mission that says, hatefel klicheres, if somebody glued an earthenware vessel that cracked. Tefillah is the binding between the Jew and Hashem. Now, binding of a Jew to Hashem could be one in, done one of two ways. We learned this many times. Either we bring God to us or us to God. Those are the two fundamentals. Then they have a joint effort. But learning Torah is actually bringing Hashem down to us, meaning it's Hashem's wisdom. Now I learn Torah, I'm understanding Hashem's wisdom, meaning I'm bringing down godliness down to me. Tefillah, on the other hand, davening, on the other hand, is the Jew refining themselves. Like it says in Shekhanach, it's a time of judgment. That's why tefillah means judgment. It's a time of judgment. A Jew is being judged when we pray. When we daven to Hashem for things, we're actually being judged. Hashem says, you're asking me for what? Do you deserve it? Should I give it to you anyway? A person is being judged. But the concept of tefillah is us from down here going up to Hashem. And then when we go up to Hashem and become connected to Hashem, the role and the function of davening is to bring it back down. That's why, according to Chassidus, we don't skip parts of davening, even to make the minion. And Allah had said, you skip, you can't leg, you skip parts of davening to be able to daven with the minion. Chassidus explains that there's four parts of, you know, there's four worlds. We learned Atzilas, Bria, Yitzir, and Asila. There's four parts of davening. There's until Baruch Sha'omar. There is from Baruch Shomer to Yishtabach. There is from Yishtabach to Shmon Esrei, the Abida, and then there's Shmon Esrei. These four levels of davening correspond with the four worlds. Until Baruch Shomer is the world of Asiya, then in Pesukah de Zimmer between Baruch Shomer and Yishtabach, we move up to the world of Yitzira. Shema and the Brachas of Shema are the level of Bria. And at Silas, which is the holiest world, the world which is eight so close and one with God, that's the Shwanesu. That's the Amida. What happened after Shwanesu? According to our Nusach, which is based on Kabbalah. After Tachnun, 
Tachnu is a culmination of the standing of Shemineses when we bow down. But then we have four parts of davening coming down. Asher Yavolatzin, the Yayim, a Yayim Yayim, Ein Kalokeinu, and Oleinu. So what is davening according to Chassidus? The way the Neshama goes upward, and then once we hit the top, we bring that Kedusha from on top back down to earth, down to earth. That's why in Yaakov's dream, the Malachim were Olim V'yordim. Not only the simple meaning, the angels of Eretz Yisrael will be going up, and Olim V'yordim means the Aved of the Sulam, which is the Aved of connection, the ladder that connects heaven and earth, so to speak. This ladder of Davini has four steps going up. The Jews are refining themselves going up. And then when they're there, there they don't stay there. The purpose is not to stay up there. The purpose is to be back, back down here. So then we bring the neshama back, the davening, the power of davening, back down here into earth. Great. Now, in this discussion with Yaakov Avinu and Hashem, if you take it face value, it doesn't sound too good. Yaakov, after he wakes up from the dream, okay, and he says like this, oh my gosh, I, I didn't know about all this, and he makes a shvua, he makes a vow, in Perkop Ches Pasikhov. But you, the Yaakov, then the neighbor. I'm going to translate it simply. Yaakov made a vow saying, if God will be with me, Ushmarani Badara Khaza and will guard me on this path to you know to and from. Asha Nechi and he give me Lachem Lachov and Lagilobich. And he'll give me what to eat and what to wear. Bishavti Bishalem El Baisovi. And he'll bring me back to my father's house. If 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 then Bahayashem Liloki, then God will be my God. It sounds pretty pathetic that Yaakov Avinu is making a deal with God as follows. God, if you're good to me, you're my God. If you're not good to me, forget it. How is Yaakov Avinu, the holiest Yaakov Avinu, say to Hashem, if you give me this, and you give me that, and you give me in love and house everything I need, then, okay, then you'll be my God. So again, Chassidus comes along and says, don't take things face value. Because that's not the proper interpretation of it. Yaakov Avinu is not making conditions with Hashem. As we mentioned before, Yaakov Avinu represents the neshama coming down to earth. A person going out to take on the day. What is the role of the Jew? In Lovin's house, okay? In Lovin's house, he says like this, if you're going to guard me from evil in Lovin's house, and I'll be able to eat food, meaning internalize things, garments represents mitzvahs encompassing things, and I come back peacefully to my father's house, meaning that Lovin's house doesn't affect me. He wasn't only talking physical peace. He's talking spiritually. That, yeah, I'm going to be able to go back home properly, healthy, not affected by Lovin. If that happens, that means that Yaakov Avinu accomplished the mission of transforming world concealment, world to godliness, then Yaakov is not saying that then the condition is. Then Yaakov says, then I'll know I accomplished. Hashem What does that mean? Hashem, the name of Yudke Vavke. Because it doesn't make sense. Hashem Hu Alekim. God is God. Yeah, what is he? Not God. What do we say? Hashem ho alekim. Or in this case, why Hashem li lelekim? So we learned. Yud ke vav ke, 
the Havaya represents the supernatural level of God, the infinite level of God. Elokim, which is 86, which is a numerical value of nature, represents world. It represents godliness coming into a concealed form where you don't see godliness. You see diversity. You see pluralism of stones. You see pluralism of everybody worshipping everything else but one Hashem. Yaakov Avinu says, what's the goal of the Jew? The goal of the Jew is the realization that what is Elohim? What is the nature of the Jew? Havaya, youth gave up, gave the supernatural. Jews don't live a natural life. Jews on a day-to-day -day day -day basis is not live, are not living a natural life. Our role is to make the world, the physical world, godly. That's supernatural. That's taking nature and making it supernatural. Making nature holy. Yaakov Avinu is not making conditions with Hashem. He says, Hashem, if you allow me to be successful in Lovin's house, not to be affected by the corruption, but on the contrary, to build the Jewish home, and I'll have spiritual food, and I'll have physical, spiritual clothing, meaning I'll have trade and mitzvahs. I won't become affected by Lovan. And you bring me back, Shole means not only peacefully, complete, that I was not hindered or lowered by Yaakov, by Lovan's house. Yaakov is going to say then to Hashem, then Vahoya, which by the way is an expression of Simcha, Hashem, then I'll realize I accomplished my mission that the supernatural is really what my nature is. My nature is supernatural. So Yaakov Avinu, according to Chassid, not making condition with Hashem because it's pretty pathetic if he is. You don't make me out. God, you know, if you're good to me, I'll be good to you. And if you're not good to me, go, you know, go fly a kite. Yaakov Avinu is not saying that. Yaakov Avinu is asking Hashem a bracha. Give me the power and ability to be able to overcome the difficulties of Lovin's house. Then I will accomplish that Havaya becomes Elohim. What is my nature? Really the supernatural. Okay. Um, now there's another question in the Parsha. All the Mepharshim ask this question. Rashi doesn't. And the Rebbe asks, why doesn't Rashi explain it? And the Rebbe explains it, that Rashi doesn't need to explain it because it's self-understood. There's a Machlekes we learned already last time also. There's an argument between the Rishenim, the early codifiers, early codifiers and Medrashim, by the way. Did the others, did the patriarchs keep Torah or not? If you remember in Parshas Ayeda, two weeks ago, we were saying, because last week we had a Fabrang, but two weeks ago, we were saying that your Avram Avinu gave the angels meat and milk together. Did he keep the Torah? Didn't he keep the Torah? So some commentaries say the others kept the Torah. Some commentaries say the others didn't keep the Torah. Some commentaries, a third opinion says, they kept the Torah only in Israel, not outside of Israel. In fact, Ramban learns that. That the others, the patriarchs, only kept Torah when they were in Israel, not when they were out of Israel. Based on that, there's a very fundamental question here. Yaakov wanted to marry Rachel. Love and tricked him, and he gave him Leah. Now, Yaakov ended up marrying Rachel, so he worked another seven years to marry Rachel. So the commentaries ask, you're not, it's biblically forbidden. A man is not allowed to marry a woman and her sister as long as the first sister is alive, which means 
if let's say there's two wives, Rachel and Leah, and somebody married Rachel and he divorced her, but she's still alive, it's biblically forbidden to marry Leah, and if they do, the kids are mamzadim. They are lochi bastards, because it's capital punishment to marry two sisters. So the question is, how in the world was Yaakov allowed to marry? Okay, married Leah first. But after he married Leah, if he kept the whole Torah, how can he marry Rachel? He's not allowed to keep. He's not allowed to marry two sisters. So the Ramban answers, by the way, it's not a question because Yaakov Avinu only kept the Torah in Israel. And therefore he says a very interesting thing. In Chutzlar, is by Lavan, he didn't keep Torah. So therefore he was allowed to marry two wives. What happened when Yaakov Avinu came back? As it says later on, the second he came to Israel, Rachel died while she was giving birth to Binyamin. So Ramban explains why did Rachel die then? Because now Yaakov Avinu is coming back to Eretz Yisrael. In Eretz Yisrael, he keeps the Torah. If he keeps the Torah, he's not allowed to have two wives, two sisters, so because Rachel was married second, so Rachel died. This is how the Ramban explains. Rashi, on the other hand, doesn't learn like that. Because Rashi says, in Vayishlach, next week's Parsha, Yaakov Avinu said to Esav, Im Lovan Garti, I lived with Lovan. And Rashi says, Garti is the same letters as Paryag, 6.13. So according to Rashi, Rashi says clearly that Yaakov Avinu kept Torah even in Lavan's house, even outside of Eretz Yisrael. So the question is, how can he marry two sisters? And the Rebbe asks, Rashi doesn't even ask the question, which means the Rebbe says that we have the five-year-old kid could figure it out on his own. How's the Rebbe answer? The Rebbe explains as follows. This that the patriarchs of Rami Yitzchok and Yaakov kept the Torah, it wasn't mandatory. It was a stricter observance on their part. It's called a Chumrah. They were Mahmud. They were strict. They were strict. And therefore they kept Torah. It's self-understood though that if by keeping Torah, which for them was a strictness, not mandatory, they would transgress something that was mandatory for them to do, then they couldn't keep Torah. In other words, Torah itself would say, you can't keep me. Because this that you're keeping Torah is only a strictness. But that can't take away from something you must do, you're obligated to do, that has precedence, precedence and precedence. So the Rebbe explained like this. What happened over here? Yaakov promised Rachel he's going to marry her. He made up he's going to marry her. Comes along Lavan and cheats him and gives him Leah. Okay? Now Yaakov has a dilemma, a big dilemma. If he keeps Torah, then he can't marry Rachel. But if he doesn't marry Rachel, he's breaking a promise that he made to her that he has to keep, that he's going to marry her. So the Rebbe explains, it's not that Yaakov didn't keep Torah. Torah itself, because it was only a strictness. I mean, if you promise your wife, sister, you're going to marry her, it doesn't mean anything because Torah says you're not allowed to. But in Yaakov's case, it wasn't forbidden for him to marry two sisters. It was only an observance on his part that he was strict. So very, therefore, the Rebbe explains the child understands that what he promised Rachel, he had to keep. I, through that, he's transgressing what the Torah says, you can't marry two sisters. It doesn't matter because Torah itself says you have to do what you have to do. And therefore, Yaakov was allowed to marry Rachel, even though it went against, it went against Torah. But if he kept Torah, he would be going against something he had to keep, i.e. keeping the promise that he had to, he promised 
Rachel that he's going to marry her. And therefore, the Rebbe explains in Pshat, in the simple meaning of the Chumash, Yaakov was allowed to marry Rachel. And not only is he allowed to, he had to marry Rachel. Because if not, he would be breaking the promise. Okay, another thing in the Parsha. Um, after they're going to different parts of the Parsha, after Yaakov was cheated, by, by, deceived by Lovin and everything, and Yaakov, Yaakov finally says, you know, I got to get out of here. So he calls him Rachel he says, okay, guys, we're leaving town. They didn't tell Lovin. Okay, they didn't tell Lovin at all. And Lovin found out about it, and he chased Yaakov. He chased Yaakov Avin. He caught up to him. And he said, what are you doing over here? He says, uh, you captured my kids. And Lovin says to him like this. He looked for the guests with the idols. Okay, so he says like this, by Yan Lovin, all the way by Shvi. Lovin says to Yaakov, Abanes Benaisai, the daughters are my daughters, Babanim Banai, and the sons are mine, Batsain Saini, and all the sheep are mine. Lovin says, You think they're your wives, they're my wives, my daughters, they're mine. You think your kids, your sons and daughters are yours? No, they're mine. Batsain Saini, and the sheep is mine. I mean, what, what conversation is that? A guy marries the Lovin's daughters. He honestly, not by hook or by crook, by crook like Lovin did. He made a living. He had sheep. What it was Lovin coming along and saying, the, the sons are mine, the daughters are mine, you stole my, it's all mine. What, what's, what's Lovin saying over here? And so again, in, in a lesson, not what happened then, in a lesson, you know, there were many Jews after the Holocaust. They came to America and they said, or from Russia for that matter, America is different. America is Andish. America is different. The previous rebel, when he came to America, said, America is not Andish. The reason why he came to America, the previous rebel said, when he came to test other region, he said, um, I came here to show America is not different than Europe. The same God, the same Torah, the same mitzvahs, the same Yiddishkeit that existed in Europe exists in America. What do, what do people come along and say about Judaism? They say it like this. The newer generate, the more modernized Haskalah movement people. They say like this, you know, you want the old guys to keep Torah mitzvahs, that's fine. You know, you guys came from Europe, you want to be, do your archaic stuff, you want to keep Torah mitzvahs, that's fine. The younger generation, that's a different world today. The younger generation, it, it doesn't belong to the old generation anymore. It's a new world, it's America. America is different. Then other people come along and they say, you know, okay, let's separate church and state, so to speak. Let's separate Torah mitzvahs and business. They say like this. God, you want to be religious in the show, you know, from in the show, big Yiddish guide at home in the show, fine. In business, what does God have to do with business? Why does God, why does God, what in the world does God have to do with business? Business is business and religion is religion. This is exactly what Lovin said to Yaakov. Yaakov took the kids, the, the daughter, the wife and the grandkids out of Lovin's house. Lovin said to Yaakov on a permanent basis, Love represents the false uh, attitudes and uh, thoughts, the philosophy that people have. Love says to Yaakov, listen, the younger generation, that belongs to love. That's a love world. 
You, Yaakov, you want to keep your turn. Mitzvahs, you're the old guys, old school. That's fine. The younger generation, they belong to the more modern world. And then love and continues. Hatsain Saini. Business, the sheep that you have, the money you made, that's fine. It's not godly. Godliness is in a show. What does business have to do with godliness? And obviously, Yaakov didn't even bother answering him, by the way. Yaakov didn't even bother answering. You don't find. Um, there, he said, you know, what do you want? Yaakov didn't even bother answering him. What's the answer over here? Lovin is completely wrong. Yiddishkeit which is not a religion, but a way of life. It's all one thing. The Nisham again comes from Be'er Sheva to Choron. Everything a Jew does is to make pluralism, the plural stones, into one God, into one stone, into one Hashem. That means from the second you wake up, until the second you go to sleep. From the second you're born, until the second you die. It's all part of serving Hashem. There is no generation gap. There's not supposed to be a generation gap between the older, the Yaakov Avinus, the older generation, and the younger generation. America is not different. We're not raising children in, by a love. We are in America. But the Torah is because it's not Lovin's kids. It's Yaakov's kids. It's Yiddishkeit. Business. Lovin wants to say separate, you know, church and business. Yaakov you know, is not bothering answering it because it's self understood. It's not Lovin's saying. The money that we make is Hashem's money. God gives us the money and he wants us. He wants us to make that money, the sign, and the, to make it godly. How? By raising a family according to Torah and Mitzvah, spending money in the way the Torah and Mitzvah want us to do it. So it's not love and sin, it's our sin. This is what Hashem is teaching us in the parsha. It's There's so many, you could talk about this parsha for hours and hours and hours. But there's another interesting thing. Okay, have to cut, cut things uh, short a little bit. There's Avram Yitzchok and Yaakov. They're called the Aves, the patriarchs. The, the Shvatim, the 12 tribes, they're not called Aves. They're not patriarchs. Okay? Avram had a unique way of serving Hashem. Yitzchak had a new unique way of serving Hashem. Yaakov had a unique way of serving Hashem. Avram did it by hospitality. Yaakov Vino did it by digging wells. Yaakov Vino this week's partial with the colored sticks, with the, with the sheep of love and uh, that old thing. That's why, when we daven Shmanes, right? What do we say at the beginning? Alokei Avram. Alokei Yitzchak, Alokei Yaakov. Why don't we say Alokei and Alokei Avesenu, Alokei Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov? Didn't they have the same God? Why do you say the God of Avram, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Yaakov? It's one God for all three. Say Alokei Avram, Yitzchak, or Yaakov. That one would be three words so short. So the portion of the Siddur explained Avram had his own unique way. Yitzchok had his own unique way, and Yaakov had his own unique way. But the fact that there are fathers, so we inherit as children everything of Avram, everything of Yitzchok, and everything of Yaakov. We have the attributes of Avram, we have the attributes of Yitzchok, and we have the attributes of Yaakov. 
but only those three. The 12 Shvatim, the 12 tribes, is not for all Jews. Meaning, the tribe of Reuven, their Aveda was Reuven, not Shimon. Shimon's tribe, their worship was Shimon, not Reuven. And Levi and Yehuda and so on. So what does it mean? In this week's passage, we're talking about, he called his name Reuven. Okay, and the Pasuk says, why did he call him Reuven? He says, because Ra Hashem on God saw. God saw. What did, when Shimon was born, what did she say, Leah? Kishama Hashem. Hashem heard. Reuven is seeing, Shimon is listening, hearing. The third son, Levi, she said, Hapam, ye love Ishiela, my husband will accompany me. And then the fourth son, Yehuda, Hapam, Eide has Hashem. Now I will thank God. That means these are different ways of serving Hashem. That if you're from Reuven, and you serve Hashem that way, if you're from Shimon, you serve Hashem this way. If you're from Levi, you serve Hashem this way. And from Yehuda, you serve Hashem this way. What does that mean? So, again, it's a lot, but cutting it short. Seeing, there's a way of seeing God, and there's a way of understanding God. When a person understands something, it becomes one with them. But not the same as when you see it. If I saw something and you proved to me that I didn't, I will not give in to what you think. Because I saw it. And if I saw it, that's one with me. Understanding, on the other hand, I understand something. Okay. So you're smarter than me, and you'll start making me crazy with questions, and you prove to me that I don't understand. And when you prove to me I don't understand, I'm going to say, yeah, I don't understand. There's a level of serving God with seeing. What do you mean seeing? You know, in English, there's an expression, when you understand something, somebody's explaining something to you, and you really understand it, you say, oh, I see. What do you mean you see? You don't see it. You understand it. What do you mean, oh, I see? If we said before, there's a level of understanding something. You understand it in such a way that no matter what you do to it, it's like seeing it. No matter what you prove to me differently, it doesn't matter because I saw it. Reuven's way of seeing Hashem is seeing. We mentioned before in a different t- class. There's a rule in halacha by capital punishment. A witness cannot sit as a judge. If a Meish Rabbeinu saw a murder in the street, okay, he cannot sit as a judge on that court case. Question, why not? <laughs> What's better than the guy, that, the judge that saw it? So the halach is ain aid nasadayin. A witness cannot become a judge. Why not? So the Rebbe brings down the commentaries that explain because a judge has to be impartial. A judge needs to be impartial. A judge needs to be able, as the Pasuk says, the shafto aida, they have to judge the community and they have to be able to save the community. If a judge is not impartial, he cannot be a judge. And therefore the law is that a judge is not allowed to hear one side without the other. They're present. Why? Because once you hear one side, you form uh, an opinion. It's not good. A witness cannot become a judge because once he saw it, he can't be impartial anymore. There's a way of a Jew serving Hashem I don't need proof that a God exists. 
I don't need proof. I don't need to understand God exists. That's the Aved of Shimon. Shimon has an understanding. And by the way, there's an advantage of understanding over seeing. You internalize it more when you understand it than when you just see it. It goes into more details. But Ruvain is a way of serving Hashem, like the Prophet says. Why was he called Ruvain? Ru. Ruvain's way of serving Hashem is seeing God in this. I don't need to understand it. I believe it. And belief is not going to, you're not going to shake my belief by asking me questions. But that's only for the tribe of Ruben. They're not patriarchs for all Jews. Shimon is understanding. Understanding means you learn Torah, you understand Torah mitzvahs, you understand it. In a more de delicate way, because they're all the Shvatim, every Jew has to have a Ruben in them and a Shimon in them and a Levian, because now we don't know which tribe we come from. So there's a Ruvain and a Shimon and a Levi and Yehuda, and you can talk about each one of the Shvatim. Levi means an accompaniment. What does it mean? You become one with them. You, Levi, Levi, it means accompany them. You become one with them, one with God. Yehuda means Hoda, submission, completely nullified, completely bottled. So these are different ways that. A Jew served Hashem. So you have the pearl, bottom line is the obvious or only Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. Then you have the Shvatim. Okay, and we've mentioned, so this explains that because we're all Jews are interconnected, so we have a little bit of Reuben, Shimon, but primarily Reuben's tribe was the Iyah, the locals. That's why he was the firstborn. Shimon is an understanding of the locals. Levi is becoming one with it. And the ultimate, by the way, is the fourth son, Yehuda, which means complete submission. And that's why the Yehuda is the letters of Yud Kevavke with the Dalit in the middle. Yud is called Yud, hey, Vav, Dalit, hey. If you take away the Dalit, it's Yud Kevavke. That's total submission. And there's stage of Chassidus explained. First, you come to the level of Re'iyah, and then you come to internalize it, and then you become one with it, and then you become completely subservient to it. This is the Aveda, and they can go through the rest of the Shvatim, by the way. But this is the Aveda that every Jew needs to have. But it's only them. Sometimes somebody asks, sometimes we can doubt ourselves and some of the questions what we saw. <laughs> If you're certain that you saw it, they can't question it. If you think you saw it, then somebody can disprove it. But if you saw it, you can't prove it. If I saw this cup, you could bring to me a million proofs that the cup doesn't exist. I'm not going to listen to you because I see it and I know it exists. And if I know it exists, then it exists. So anyway, again, this parsha is, and if we only touch the surface of the parsha. There's so many other incidents with Rachel hiding the, the idols and, and Yaakov Avinu with the mirror. It's unbelievable what's going on in this parsha. Anyway, that's it for tonight. The Mitzvah Shem Wednesday night will be Aloch and Tanya. And um, everybody, we should hear good news and to throw. Amen. 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 All the best. We'll see you Mitzvah Amen. Wednesday night. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Amen. Thank you.